I shut the door into his bedroom the first time just to keep the smoke out of there. Well, now at least half of the, the house is well involved in fire. And so the sixth or seventh time I went in, the, the bedroom itself was starting to fill pretty good with smoke. And I'm by myself, and I'm starting to cover my face with my shirt and my hood and the thing I was wearing. And um, I realized that if I pass out at this point, there's no one here to pull me out. We're Jake and Jenny Dilbeck, and we live at uh, 7800 Wheeler Canyon Road. We're about a quarter of a mile from the very end of the canyon. On the east side of the canyon, we live on about 45 acres. On the night of December 4th, we were getting our kids ready for bed. It was about 6.20 at night. Uh, we have some friends that live in the back house, and we also have some, um, we had some friends over from Idaho, Jenny's best friend from college, and their family were at our house, and we were, between us we had five kids, so we were getting Under them Under the age of six. Under the age of six, yeah. <laughs> so we're getting them all ready for bed, and our neighbors came over, and they, they, they kind of called me outside without trying to draw too much attention to the rest of the family. And uh, she pointed over our hill and said, do you see this? And I looked up, and there was a, a glow coming from which looked like a long ways away. So not to get everyone too excited, I said, you know what, let me just run up the hill and take a look. So I hopped on my tractor went through the fence, took a friend of mine with me uh, that was there with us, and uh, took some flashlights. We drove as far as we could up the hill, walked the rest of the way about the last uh, 100 yards or so to the top of the hill, stood on the top of the hill and looked across. And I could see the fire burning at what looked about around the area of the 150, right around Steckle Park. And um, I could see it looked like a long ways away, but as I was standing on the hilltop, the wind was just blasting me in the face. And I could tell it was pushing it at us. But being that it was dark and it was seemed to be a long ways away, this is the third brush fire that we've lived through since we've been there. And the first two were right next to our property. One burned one property over, made it to our fence line, and we were home all day. We watched it, no big deal. The other one was started by our next door neighbors, some boys playing with fire, literally, and it burned up over our property. And so we didn't really think much of it. It looked to be a long ways away. And I really thought that we had plenty of time. Meanwhile, our phone started ringing off the hook with neighbors and friends texting and calling, concerned, asking if we know anything. Are we OK? Do we need help evacuating? We hadn't gotten an evacuation notice. So we kind of just stood around looking at each other. Should we leave? Should we not? Are we OK? We have five kids under the age of six. Do we really want to pack everybody up and leave? Yeah. So. And me being a firefighter, my neighbors are all calling me, and they're assuming that I'm going to know what to do. And I just kind of said, hey, everyone, just calm down. It's not a big deal. It looks like it's a long ways away. We're going to be fine. So we threw some things in the car. We kind of started to get ready. She was fighting me on it big time. She did not <laughs> want to leave. She remembered the two previous fires. We thought this is no big deal. In the meantime, the wind started getting really bad. It blew a shelter all over that we had. And I thought, this is, this is uncharacteristically strong winds. The glow started, once we, once I started seeing black smoke come up over our hill, I thought, okay, it's probably time to take the kids and get out of here. So she didn't want to leave me there, but I said, you know what, I'll stay, here, stay around, I'll look after the place. If the fire gets close, then I'll head out. And so uh, I just figured I had plenty of time. It seemed to be miles away. And at this point, I left with the kids, was driving down our canyon, and could see how bad the glow was pretty close to our house. And so when we got cell phone service, I tried calling him and texting him saying, it looks really bad. I really think you need to leave. And I couldn't get a hold of him. Uh, made it to my parents' house in Ventura, got the kids settled for bed, kept trying to call him. About 45 minutes had passed, and I finally heard from him. I stayed home. I was watching the fire. And about 20 minutes after she left, I noticed the glow was significant, and I started actually seeing flames coming over the ridge of our, of our property and coming onto my neighbor's property. And I actually kind of panicked a little bit because I knew that the road of the canyon paralleled where the fire was coming in. So we kind of live off the end of the canyon. The road was this way. So as the fire was coming in, I, I promised her I would leave as soon as I saw flames. And at that point, the wind was blowing so strong, and it was coming in, I thought, I'm not going to make it out. So 
I normally would have just stayed home because we have pretty good brush clearance around our house and I feel pretty safe at home and knowing what I know about fires and things like that. So I started heading out. And as I'm heading out, I had, since I had told their other neighbors that it was going to be okay and just to hang out, I stopped in to check on both of them. I snapped some pictures. I took some videos. And I made sure that they were all leaving. And we all kind of started to caravan together. And as we're coming down, the canyon fires all around us. It's already blown over Wheeler Canyon, and it's burning everywhere around us. It looked like half the canyon was on fire. I thought, there's no way these houses are going to make it. And I couldn't believe it happened so fast. 20 minutes before she left, she didn't see a single flame. I drive out and now I can't get out. The fire's already ahead of me. So as I make it about two miles down the canyon, I'm stopped by a line of cars backing up and taillights. Just before that, I had lost the road altogether. Smoke and flames were coming over the road and I couldn't even see. I thought I was gonna drive off into the ditch. Well, apparently, just ahead of me, someone did. The only fatality was a neighbor, a lady that we knew. We see her all the time uh, walking her dog. So she was the first actual death that, was, that happened in the Thomas Fire, and that was a, a neighbor that we actually we know and we see on a regular basis. She had driven off in the ditch, and no one could get around her. So we all backed up. One fire truck had finally made it up the canyon, and they told us, hey, you can't get through. We're going to take shelter in this field. At that point, there was a big opening in a pasture. They opened up some fence. We drove in. Several of us were in our cars, and now we're just, we're just watching the fire burn all around us. I took some more videos, and at that point, you thank me. the Lord, I actually had service on my <clears throat> phone. So I called her to let her know we're okay. I was, my other neighbor was with me. I called his wife to let her know that he was okay. And then and it um, was a little bit reassuring to finally hear from him because I didn't know where he was or what was happening. But he called and said, I'm stuck in the middle of a field. I am with a fire truck. I'm with some of our neighbors, but there's fire burning all around us. I feel pretty safe or in an open field. I'll call you when I can. Service was kind of breaking up, and so I think that was about 9.45. Yeah. And then I sat at my parents, not knowing what was happening, and didn't hear from him again until about 1.30 in the morning. Once I realized that the fire had passed me, and based, based on what I know, once that fire front blows by, the, the real danger's over. So in my mind, I knew I was safe. The problem was I my family and my wife <laughs> did not. And so they thought that I was still in serious danger. So. I kind of went back and several cars had kind of piled around and I kind of went to the front of the gate where we, we were. I walked over there and I just said, hey, what's going on? What's the status? And, and one of the guys said, hey, I just drove all the way to the end, turned around and came back. There's no one up there and a bunch of houses are on fire. And I looked at him and I said, well, be careful. One of those might be my house. And so I, so I hopped in the truck and I told my neighbor, I said, hey, the fire's passed. Let's go see if our houses are there. So we ended up, him and I dropped in our trucks and now we drove back up the canyon and Meanwhile, as I'm driving up, everything's burning around us. There's several houses that are on fire. And I pulled down my driveway just kind of thinking, well, we'll see what happened. And uh, I live on like a 45-acre cul-de-sac is probably the best way to describe it. So I live on the back, this corner. I have another 45-acre here, 45-acre here, 45-acre here. And we all share a private driveway off the main road. So I drive down my driveway, and both of these houses on the front are on fire. A neighbor in the back, he's actually an LA County fireman and they were out of town, they were actually in South Africa, so I was very concerned for his house. So I drove down the driveway, lo and behold, my house is still there. But I have a garage with an with a Edison pole retaining wall that's going like a bonfire, I can only describe, and it's about 10 feet away from my garage. So I ran up my driveway, parked the truck, I had the dogs in the car, I threw them in the garage, and I kind of just made a quick assessment of my house. Obviously, there's a lot of little spot fires, little campfires kind of going on around the house, but the house, is okay. So I grabbed some hose, threw some hose together, ran around, and put out those little fires. Mostly that retaining wall in the back, I was most concerned about that spreading to the garage and then to the house. So anyway, I kind of put all these fires out and I kept looking up to my neighbor's house. And I could tell something was burning, but I couldn't tell if his house was burning. And I didn't know the situation of the hoses and whatever, so I threw all the hose I had in my truck and I motored around and I drove up to his house and I got up there and his house looked to be okay. I ran around the back and he had had a deck and a screened in porch and a big area that has all burned to the ground. Now, or not, it's currently on fire at this point. It's all burning and part of his eave on the back of his house had just started to burn. So I thought, I got this, I could put this out. So I had been to his house a couple times, I knew where all his faucets and things were and I hook up to the first one, there's no water. Run around to the back of the house. I had patched a, a water line for him. Being that we're both firemen, when we're off, our wives tend to use each other to fix things when they're broken, and we tend to try to help each other out, and we've been family friends with him forever, so I'd been up to his house several times fixing things. 
So I knew there was a shutoff on the backside, so I went back there, I turned it on, and I could just hear air escaping, no water. Now I'm getting frustrated, I'm starting to panic. And as I'm running around the house, I keep looking, and the fire's starting to spread, starting to grow a little bit on his house. And I ran around, I followed some other hoses he had out, I went to another shutoff, no water. I, I couldn't get the water to turn on anywhere. So by the time I came back to his front door, the third or fourth time, I kicked in his front door, and fire's just rolling across the ceiling of his living room. And at this point, I needed a firefighting hose line. A, a garden hose wasn't going to put it out. And so I knew that I wasn't going to save his house. But I knew the layout of his house. I'd been in there several times. So I ran around to the back of his house, kicked in the door to his bedroom, and I just started pulling stuff out. So I found a tray with his wife's jewelry, some family photos, and I had pulled some things out. I found a safe, and I found some things, and I went in probably four, five, six, seven times. You grabbed all the drawers from, they had a desk yeah. in their bedroom full of drawers that had important papers, so he grabbed all of that, and it actually had a lot of photos, um, which was really neat to be able to get yeah. them later. I felt very defeated that I couldn't save his house because I was excited thinking I was gonna save his house. And so, um, when I about the sixth or seventh time I went into his house, I shut the door into his bedroom the first time just to keep the smoke out of there. Well, now at least half of the, the house is well involved in fire. And so um, the sixth or seventh time I went in, the, the bedroom itself was starting to fill pretty good with smoke. And I'm by myself, and I'm starting to cover my face with my shirt and my hood and the thing I was wearing. And um, I realized that if I pass out at this point, there's no one here to pull me out. So I saved what I could. The wind is blowing the stuff around the back of my truck. I'm trying to save all this stuff. Go, I load his truck up and I realize, okay, I've saved about everything I can from the house. He had four cars parked underneath a carport. And I pulled some things out of the glove boxes. I'm searching for keys. I found out later all the keys were inside the living room that was burning initially. So I wasn't going to save the cars, which is frustrating as well because I could have just backed his cars out, hopefully potentially save those. So at that point, I drove back down to my house, very defeated, very felt like I had let him down. And I knew that my other two neighbors' houses had burned. So of the four properties that we all share property lines, ours was the only one who, who made it. So I spent the rest of the night kind of putting out some spot fires around our house and just keeping, uh, keeping the fire away from our house. And then um, I ended up driving back out the canyon. And on my way out, I stopped at my other neighbors and the ones I knew that were home. I checked on their houses, one of my neighbors who wasn't home, I had put out some little things of grass around her house, but she was okay. And then my other neighbor, I checked on him and he was okay. So then I drove all the way back out to the canyon, called her and let her know that I was okay. So this is probably about midnight, one in the morning. I think it was about one o'clock in the morning and he just said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is our house is okay and I'm okay. But the bad news is everybody around us is gone. So he said, I'll call our one neighbor, can you call this other neighbor? And I said, okay, and I, I had kind of gone into shock, I think, at my parents a little bit, not hearing from him for three and a half hours, um, not knowing if he was okay. It was <laughs> probably the worst night of my life. Um, yeah, it was just really hard. And then having to call our neighbor and tell her that her barn was gone, and that was just a really hard phone call to make. And I think the whole night just felt very surreal yeah you know it felt so like such an out-of-body experience from standing in our driveway a couple hours before looking at the glow thinking i wonder if this is even going to come our way to thinking it burned everything around us it was just such an such a surreal experience yeah for sure and it was hard too after i failed to save his house i was kind of making my way around the property checking on stuff putting out spot fires and every once, I was trying not to, but every once in a while I'd look up and see his house burning and just think to myself, I gotta tell this guy, he's a good friend of mine, I gotta tell him that I failed to save his house, that his house burned down. I gotta tell my other two neighbors that their house is burned down. And it was a weird, surreal feeling knowing I'm the only one who knows right now. I'm out here by myself and no one else knows, you know? And um, when I went back up, I have water storage tanks on my house and I thought, you know what, let me make sure that I have all my tanks turned on so that I don't have an issue with water supply so I can go all night. Well, when I went up to those tanks, I found one of my horses and she just was, you could tell she'd been through it. She's terrified. She screamed at me, is the only best way I can describe it, neighed just super loud at me. And I uh, 
walked over to her and she wouldn't even let me touch her. She was just so terrified. And um, I went back around the next morning to the other side of the property and I found my other horse who was badly burned. His eyes were swollen shut. I was surprised he was even alive. And um, I tried talking to him and he did the same thing, just screamed at me, like almost calling for help. And I kind of touched him and he freaked out. That's when I could tell he couldn't see. And uh, he stayed in that position for almost 24 hours. He, I came back up the next day and um, he had not moved from the spot I left him. And I put a halter on him, I gave him some water and I brought him back down and he's actually my cousin's horse. So the two of us together worked together to bring him down. And I for sure thought he was gonna make it. Well, he's alive today and we've been giving him antibiotics and I think he's gonna be fine. And I had four horses and, and I found one. She, she, was, um, she didn't make it, she fell in a ravine. And then another one I never did find. So I think he's down somewhere. But um, I could tell what had happened to them. They had tried to run up to, to run, outrun the fire and they, they just got caught. And just the indicator to me, just assessing the whole property, knowing how fast the fire burned, I found a full grown male deer on my property and a bobcat, along with several rats, rabbits, and squirrels. And I mean, if you've ever seen a, a deer run, you know what it must, how fast that fire must have been moving for a full grown male deer to get caught. So um, to me, it was just a miracle that our house made it and we had brush clearance and um, we feel very thankful that our house is still standing, but it was really hard the weeks following just living in our house and every day driving to our house and seeing the devastation around us. You know, your heart just feels so heavy for people that you love and people that you care about who are you're close to and memories that we have of our friends' homes and, you know, we've lived there for almost 10 years now and um, yeah, so just a lot of memories. So I think that was really hard. Just you feel feeling two such huge emotions at the same time, you know, like of such gratefulness and thankfulness that our home is still standing and that we made it, but also such sadness for the people around you, I think has been the hardest thing. Yeah, I, I drove out the next morning to come to her parents' house who live in Ventura, thinking to myself, this is the biggest fire that's ever hit Wheeler Canyon. This is gonna be the Wheeler Canyon brush fire of 2017. And then I come down Foothill Road's closed <laughs> off and all of Onolando's burning and the whole city's on fire and I was just blown away because I, I thought what I had just been through was so terrible and now all the people of Ventura are going through it and it was just pretty unreal. And then like she said, the hardest part has just been several weeks after driving up, we live all the way at the end of the canyon and we were driving past all our friends' houses that are gone and it looks like a volcano and it's just a depressing dark area. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing has been just seeing the people of our canyon, our family, and the people of Ventura come together, support each other. We got people bringing generators over, we're helping each other out, we're organizing work parties for each other, cleaning up each other's houses, doing everything we can to get insurance in, to look at our properties and take care of things and encouraging each other and just the family atmosphere and the, the way that it's bonded all of us together through this event has just been pretty amazing to see. And we're just so thankful that that everyone's okay, that our, my children aren't traumatized for it, that we got them out in time, and that um, everyone's safe. There's a few things to think about. I think number one, for me, being the firefighter that was home, and I wasn't at work, and I'm so thankful that I was home, and knowing that all my neighbors were looking to me for guidance and support, and I took it so lightly and thought, hey, it's a long ways away. The fact was, it was a brush fire with hurricane force winds, this was a perfect storm. You're late December, and we hadn't had any rain at that point. Things are extremely dry. You don't think of December the 4th as brush season. And um, it was literally just the perfect storm. And the fact was, we had not had any notification to evacuate. There was no sense of urgency from anyone around us that, that we were in any real danger at that point. And I didn't think we were either. And I think this fire moved so fast and with such ferocity that it caught everyone off guard. Mm -hmm. And I think that it caught me off guard. We were playing golf that day, and the friend that was with us said to me, uh, do you guys get a lot of wind around here? And I was like, yeah, it's kind of sporadic, not really. We played a whole round of golf, and it was a beautiful day, and it hadn't, <laughs> wasn't really windy, and the wind didn't pick up till late, so we were really just complacent, and we really didn't think much of it. And I think it just, 
this was just a tornado of epic proportion that we just did not see coming. I'm not bitter or resentful towards anybody. I don't think that anybody let us down or failed us. I think that it hit everyone as fast as it could. The, out, the outpouring of the fire department is never surprising to me. I've been around for 10 years, and whenever someone's family's in trouble or a kid gets sick or there's someone needs help, the fire department's a family, and it, it, it spans departments. It's not just any particular department. We're all a brotherhood, and we all look out for each other. And um, I, I think it's not that surprising to me, but it makes me proud that, that my brothers all came together to look out and take care of each other. And I'm, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Mm -hmm.